Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Shutters and with me I have Matej Trampus, who is uh, engineering director at um, uh, at Inchain and one of the main brains behind uh, the Bitcoin SV node uh, project. Um, we're here to talk to you today about a few different transaction types uh, and um, ways of, of constructing transactions uh, to enable some novel use cases. We're also going to cover one of the um, hottest topics in, in Bitcoin over the last couple of years, which is uh, the lengthening of chain transaction uh, or chains of transactions uh, uh, with the raising of, of the ancestor limit. Uh, and Mate is going to go into some of the detail as to why it was actually uh, such a hard thing to do uh, and what we've done about it. Uh, but I will begin. And here. We're going to start today by talking about a new class of transaction called dust return. Uh, first, I'm going to explain what the dust problem is uh, and uh, how the dust return transaction uh, deals with it. Um, so dusting, uh, or the dusting attack rather, is a, is a pretty well-known phenomenon uh, on Bitcoin. It's been going on for, for many years. Um, and it's a mechanism of basically breaking uh, the privacy of Bitcoin users. So the dust attacker starts with a list of Bitcoin addresses, which they've uh, harvested from the public blockchain, because of course, the first time you use an address, um, the uh, address gets uh, put into a transaction, the transaction gets put into the blockchain, and um, uh, that of course makes it public. Um, so the attacker begins with a whole list of addresses that, um, that don't apparently have any relation to each other. Uh, as far as they can see at this time. Um, and if you never reuse an address, of course, they'll never be able to uh, derive any connection between one address and another. So the dust attacker actually begins by sending very small amounts of Bitcoin. Um, and when we say dust, uh, it's commonly brought up in the context of the dust threshold, which is a, an amount of Satoshis, which is so low uh, that you can't actually spend it economically. In this context, uh, the dust is actually slightly higher than that because otherwise, normally the Bitcoin miners would uh, would reject transactions that, that contain them. So by reusing existing addresses and sending these small amounts of dust, uh, it's it's a fairly inconsequential cost to the to the dust attacker. Um, they can send them, and they basically arrive in the wallet of the person that had used that um, uh, that address previously. Now, that doesn't necessarily matter until such time as later on you go to spend some Bitcoins and your wallet then goes through and tries to find some inputs that are unspent. Uh, and of course, if you spent the one uh, where the address was initially published onto the blockchain, that's not going to be selected. But you've got this new one here now, which is uh, the one that originated from the dust attacker. If your wallet software is not smart enough to, um, to be aware of, of this, what's very likely to happen is that they'll collect one of these dust inputs along with one of your uh, real legitimate inputs uh, and use both of them in a transaction, which creates a link between, uh, between the two. So note that the inputs to this transaction are actually different addresses, uh, but because they've appeared in the same transaction, um, it's reasonably easy to infer that they came from the same wallet. Um, so now that you've used the, this, uh, this dust input, uh, those outputs are all connected. And um, as I say, they're identified as part of the same wallet. But this is of course a privacy concern, um, but it also creates uh, other issues which we'll get into uh, in a moment. The mitigation for this is one that is not necessarily universally adopted by wallets, which is identify dust uh, that's come into your wallet and then uh, never spend it. So this has a few downsides, one of which is your wallet basically has to keep and maintain this dust forever. Your wallet needs to be smart enough to ignore it and to remember to continue, uh, continue ignoring it for forever. Uh, and of course, because you're ignoring it, these Satoshis that are locked up in this output basically will sit there forever, uh, unspent, and um, they become an entry in the UTXO database, which is a, a, a permanent burden, essentially, um, uh, for the miners. Uh, as the number of, uh, of these, these dust transactions increases, so does the size of the UTXO database, uh, which contains a whole bunch of entries that will uh, 
um, that are effectively there for no reason uh, because they'll never be spent, but the miner can't rule out the possibility that they will be spent. And if they do, and the miner has deleted them, then um, the miner's going to be in trouble because they'll fall out of consensus with the rest of the network. So we've come up with a new way to, um, to address this problem, uh, to clean it up. And uh, it's essentially a special type of transaction called a dust return transaction. Um, it effectively becomes a donation to the miner. And we'll get into the details in a moment of uh, how you construct one. But it basically allows you to send the dust uh, out of your wallet uh, to a miner. So it has a couple of net benefits. One is the dust gets cleaned up. <clears throat> it's out of your wallet. It's out of the miner's database. The attacker actually learns nothing because we do this in such a way as there's no connection between uh, the dust that they've sent you and any other input in your wallet. This basically removes the incentive for the attacker uh, to perform the dust attack in the first place. In fact, it turns the incentive into a penalty because they still incur the cost of doing so. Uh, it might be small, but uh, add up over, you know, if, if a dusting dust attacker is, is sending out hundreds of thousands or millions of, um, of dust outputs, it, it adds up to something significant. Uh, and if they gain nothing from it, then they actually have no reason to do it. Uh, and the final and probably most important uh, one of the benefits is that the Satoshis that get locked up in this dust uh, are actually allowed to return uh, to circulation. So what does a dust return transaction look like? Um, it's got a few rules around what defines a dust return transaction. Firstly, it has one input uh, and in fact it doesn't have any uh, limit on the number of Satoshis that uh, are in the input. You could actually spend uh, 10 BSV in a, in a dust return transaction if you wanted to, but um, you probably wouldn't because you'd be giving it away. Uh, essentially. The dust return transaction has one single op return output uh, that has the protocol identifier uh, dust, uh, or actually it's four bytes, which is the ASCII bytes for, for, the, um, for the string dust. Um, and this um, uh, requirement is there for a specific reason, because if you allowed additional data or any other sort of data uh, in the transaction, um, it would effectively become a free mechanism for data carrier. The other important requirement is that the value of the output is set to zero. This means that the entire input value essentially becomes a donation to the miner via the transaction fee. If it doesn't fit this pattern, it doesn't get classified as a dust return transaction and it will be evaluated against normal fee limits, um, uh, of, you know, according to the regular sort of fee evaluation rules. But if it does, then it becomes an exception uh, and the miner will accept, uh, by default, will accept these transactions um, regardless. Um, so oh, I probably should have been scrolling through these as I, as I explained. Um, <clears throat> so that's it. It's, it's really simple to construct these. Uh, and the end game would be, I suppose, that wallets would actually uh, be aware of this dust return transaction type. When they detect a dust transaction coming into the wallet, they would then prepare the dust return transaction and the next time the user interacts, uh, usually wallets require some authorization from users to sign transactions. They prompt the user and say, would you like to clean up dust? Uh, if the user clicks yes, then uh, the wallet would sign those transactions and send them out. Uh, and that's it. Your wallet's clean of all of the dust and, uh, and the attacker has learned nothing. There are a couple of additional parameters uh, on the Bitcoin D side. We don't need to go into too much detail for them, but uh, this is a feature that of course is configurable. You can turn it off uh, if you want to, um, but these are details that are probably more important for the uh, miners who are, who are operating this as a service. Um, and that brings us to the next type of transaction, which is the consolidation transaction. Uh, and they actually happen to share a couple of config parameters, but again, these are important on the, um, on the mining side. Uh, and the second one, the consolidation factor, is uh, probably the most important from the point of view of consolidation transactions. We'll get to explaining that one in a moment. Now, consolidation transactions have actually been around and enabled for uh, quite a while. It was late last year, maybe October last year, I think, that um, uh, they were first enabled. 
Um, and that led to a, a, a lot of interesting conversation about the concept of nano services. Um, there is a, an article on the Bitcoin SB website, uh, bitcoinsb.io website, that goes into quite a lot more detail about consolidation transactions, but um, we will cover some of the uh, basic elements of them here. So what are they? If a transaction that reduces the number of UTXOs by a margin that is more valuable to the network than the implied fee, uh, then it enables use cases for transactions that might normally be uneconomic. And the general idea is um, that aside from being another mechanism for cleaning up dust, uh, it's different to dust return in that it does have uh, privacy implications. Um, it also enables uh, what we call nano services that basically allow uh, software, um, allow services to piggyback on top of transactions that were already going to happen anyway. Um, so what do they look like? Um, so over here on the left, I've got a list of a thousand transactions and I've sort of uh, squished that list up a little bit because otherwise this slide would be very, very big. Um, and we're essentially feeding a lot of outputs that are of a, of a value that would normally be considered dust uh, into a transaction as inputs. We then basically are able to add all of the values of those, uh, those inputs together into a single output and, and consolidate the value for you know, 1,000 inputs in to, to one input out. And you can see on the output side, we've now got 10,000 Satoshis, which is actually a use, useful amount. And if the right conditions are met, then um, then we can class this, uh, or the Bitcoin SV software rather, classes this as a consolidation transaction, um, and it allows it to, to go through with zero fee. We'll get to the reasons why miners might want to do this later. Uh, this is um, this is the next transaction in the chain where you actually make use of it. And you can see it's a normal Bitcoin transaction um, that's uh, got a fee of 250 sats in this particular case. So benefits for the Bitcoin network, um, the UTXO size has basically been decreased. Uh, we've taken a thousand inputs and turned them into one. That means that every miner can now shrink their UTXO database. Um, and of course, the dust itself becomes useful again. Um, so let's talk about how uh, this is actually potentially useful. Well, cleaning up dust is one way of doing it, but we've got the dust return uh, type of transaction now that, uh, that essentially solves that problem in what I think is a, probably a more elegant way. Um, but dust return allows basically any service provider to accept extremely small payments uh, for what I've termed to be nano services um, with the expectation that even though what they're charging is lower than a transaction fee that would be required for them to spend it, they can consolidate those, uh, those later. So here's an example, Merkle proof return. When you submit a transaction to a miner through Mappy, you can optionally ask for them to send you back a Merkle proof later on. Now, miners might want to do this for free, uh, but they might also want to charge for the service, but it's a very, very small service. It, it requires a, um, <clears throat> uh, a HTTP call to uh, an SPV channel server. Uh, that's that's pretty minimal service level. Um, you probably wouldn't normally be able to charge enough for a service like that to, um, to make it uh, be worth more than the dust limit. Uh, but in this case, you can charge as little as one Satoshi for, uh, for, for providing that service. From the miner's point of view, it's a net benefit because if you choose that particular miner to submit your transactions through and ask for your Merkle proofs, they'll still get that Merkle proof fee regardless of whether or not they mine the transaction. So that would mean that you would construct a transaction that has a normal transaction fee that would be collected by whichever miner mines it into a block, but it also has an extra output that pays this particular miner, uh, one Satoshi or 10 Satoshis, for example. And of course, later on, they collect them all up, pick them all up. And just to give you some ideas of other ways that you could make use of this, uh, insurance is, is one. Um, we don't think that double spends uh, need insuring anymore, but uh, there used to be services like that where you, you actually could buy double spend insurance for a transaction. Um, the insurance could be for something else uh, completely unrelated, uh, uh, but related to the transaction. Um, so this insurance might be, 
on a per transaction basis, uh, and it might be a you know, very very low amount. So again, uh, if the amount was the cost of the insurance service was significantly above the dust fee, wouldn't be a problem. But if it's close to the dust fee, even if it's double of the dust fee, it means that half of the um, a significant chunk of the the cost of that would have to be paid in um, in transaction fees later on uh, in order to to consolidate them. So again, it's another example where you can take a transaction that was going to happen anyway and, and add value add services or purchase value add services uh, related to that transaction um, uh, for very minimal amounts. Um, another example, which we're going to see a lot more detail about uh, from Mate is uh, double spend notifications. This is a service that's not normally provided uh, by the Bitcoin network. Uh, it can be provided by individual miners um, and they may or may not want to charge for that. Something that's completely unrelated to uh, the business of putting together Bitcoin transactions might be micro, uh, uh, micro taxes. Uh, or taxes rather for, for micropayments. So imagine sales tax, it's, it's a common scenario that we talk about in, uh, in Bitcoin, creating a Bitcoin transaction that actually pays not just for the service that you're receiving, but it pays all of the suppliers uh, and it even pays the tax so all in the same transaction. Normally that will work okay if you're buying something worth $10 or uh, you know even a dollar. Um, the transaction fee is, is fairly trivially small in comparison to the main payment or even uh, some of the, um, the broken down sub payments like the VAT. But what if you're buying a microservice? Uh, what if you're buying something that's worth a cent? Um, then the VAT on that is actually worth uh, significantly less. There is some point in that, uh, in that value curve where the microservice itself is economic in terms of being able to pay a Bitcoin transaction fee and that not being a significant amount of the cost of the microservice. But the sales tax, which is a small percentage of that, actually does fall below that threshold. Um, so this is another classic example where uh, you can pay that directly to whichever tax department happens to live in your country uh, and they can collect them all, consolidate them later and um, uh, incur no fee losses uh, in doing so. So that brings me to building of a consolidation transaction. We've imposed some, um, some limits on how a consolidation transaction is defined. And this is specifically for the reason that if you don't do this, uh, it becomes reasonably easy to try and exploit this as a mechanism to get lower fees anyway by just uh, taking an existing output, splitting it up into, into many, many small ones and, and making payments using lots of the small um, uh, inputs to, um, to basically get zero fee. The maths is quite complicated, but there is a point where that is uh, actually economic to do uh, and cheaper than just paying the transaction fee that you would have had to have uh, paid anyway. So there are a bunch of limits in terms of how many inputs are required uh, versus how many outputs uh, for a consolidation transaction to be considered a consolidation transaction. And if it doesn't meet those limits, then it's just treated as a normal transaction and will more than likely be rejected because of the fact that it doesn't have a fee. So because those rules are actually quite complicated, um, and I'll show them to you in a moment, um, we've come up with some rules of thumb uh, that are that basically uh, give you a very wide margin for error. Um, so here we've said we suggest that you consolidate at least 100 inputs to, uh, to one output. Uh, in reality, you can probably get away with as low as 20, but uh, there are other conditions that will then come into play. But if you're using regular, uh, um, you know, pay to public key hash inputs, then, um, uh, then then it becomes simpler. I only use inputs that have been confirmed for at least six blocks. Um, there's a particular reason why this, uh, this limitation is imposed, which I won't get into now, um, but it's relatively easy to, um, <coughs> to meet this condition because even if you don't check that, uh, that all of your inputs uh, actually pass this test, you can still construct the transaction and then just wait for an hour for six blocks to get mined and then submit it to the network. Um, things are simplified in terms of evaluating whether it's a 
a valid consolidation transaction if you use standard inputs like pay to public key hash or multi-sig with uh, with no more than uh, than two signatures. Uh, again, you can get around that as a limitation, but um, it doesn't mean you've got to go into the detail of, uh, of what defines a consolidation transaction. Um, and okay, this box is probably meant to pop up uh, a third. Um, and that's what I said before is uh, the six block confirmation rule is relatively easy to get around just by delaying the, um, the sending of a consolidation transaction by an hour. Um, I don't think that's actually a um, significant blocker for someone who's using consolidation transactions as part of their business model because they have to wait for significant numbers of these uh, inputs to accumulate before they can make uh, consolidation transactions anyway. So that delay between receiving the first of the set of payments and the um, and the consolidation is is already inherently part of the mechanism. So this is the actual formula, uh, and if I recall rightly, I think this might be from a Python script, so you should be able to cut and paste that into, uh, into a Python interpreter relatively easily. Uh, as you can see, it's a lot more complex, and I'm not proposing to go into, into all of the detail, um, but it is explicitly documented, um, and this example script, of course, will tell you whether your uh, transaction is consolidation or not. The good news is if it's not, um, uh, it will no doubt be rejected by a miner. They won't accept it into the mempool. There's no double spend issue to, to be worried about. Um, so you can just basically modify the transaction and try again. And that brings me to the end, I think, of consolidation transactions. And I'm going to hand over now uh, to Mate uh, to cover the next Topic? Oh, the hot topic. Ancestor Thanks, Matteo. Thank you. Uh, can you please enable? Oh, thanks. Okay. So, yes, for the grand finale, DEFCON, we take, uh, take a look at two areas that sparked a lot of recent interest. You know? The first one is removal of dread the 25 transaction limit. This limit means that the transaction can only have 25 unconfirmed ancestors or descendants. And transaction dependencies uh, are natural in Bitcoin. Here are two examples. If I go to a shop and buy a $5 item with a $10 bill, I will get back some change. And I can use this change to buy something else. That second transaction now has one ancestor. And the limit prohibits me from making a lot of such transactions in a short time. But besides the monetary value, transaction can also carry information. Let's say that a transaction represents a move in an online game and that dependencies between transactions represent dependencies between moves. In this case, uh, the limit restricts the number of moves that can be played by a player um, in 10 minutes. That may, might be okay if you're playing correspondence chess, but not so okay for other games. So the limit has been put in for wrong reasons and we'll take a quick, uh, quick look at how it was removed. Uh, the second topic that we'll touch is uh, double spend attempt notification. If you're a merchant that you have just received a payment from your customer, you want to be notified if customer is trying to spend coins for something else. And double spend notification will deliver you a warning when something fishy is going on. Some deep architectural changes were required uh, for removing 25 per section limit, and we'll just take a look at two of them. Uh, block assembly and the mempool. So imagine that you're a miner and you have a mempool full of transaction, but your block size is limited to one megabyte. So what can you do? You need to decide which transaction you will put into the block. You cannot take all of them. So you sort the transaction by fee and only pick the most valuable one leaving all the others in the mempool. That's why on some blockchains, customers have to pay up to $50 or more when buying a $2 coffee. To further complicate things, transactions are dependent on each other, so you cannot just pick a valuable child without including its parents. This whole process is quite CPU intensive and 
in some old note versions that were used for performance measurement, it could took up to 28 seconds to assemble a big block. And this process of block assembly is repeated every time a mining uh, software requests a new block candidate, which is every 30 seconds, leaving only four seconds per minute to do some other processing like transaction validation. Clearly, this is not the right approach, but it's the price you pay if you have if you only handle small blocks. So can we do better? If blocks are big enough, we, we can just take all of the transactions that are in the mempool and put them in a block in one go. And that's why the that's what the new journaling block assembler that was introduced a few versions ago in the Bitcoin SQL Node software does. Okay, I oversimplified a little bit. In order for transaction to get included in a block, it needs to pay a minimum mining fee. So what we did in the BSV node software is that we split mempool in two logical segments. The primary mempool contains transactions that pay enough fee. This part, this is the part that will get included in the block. And the secondary mempool contains transactions that do not pay enough. We still want to validate and process those transactions because somebody else might mine them. If this happens, this speeds up the block validation because we already validated the transactions. And keeping those transactions around also helps with double spend protection. So when a transaction comes in, we put it in a primary mempool if it pays enough fee. If it does not pay enough fee, we put it in a secondary mempool. If new transaction depends on another unconfirmed transaction, we just link it and attach it to its parents. It can also happen that one part of the chain is in the primary mempool, but the rest of the chain is not paying enough. Uh, so it ends up in the secondary mempool. But what happens if, if a high fee transaction extends the chain that is already in the, sec already in the secondary mempool? Well, if it does not cover uh, the debt that was accumulated by its ancestors, the whole chain remains in the secondary mempool and maybe somebody else will mine it. But if it does pay enough fee to cover the debt, the whole chain will be moved to primary mempool. This feature is called child, child face, face for parent. Um, some other Bitcoin, Bitcoin forks remove this feature because it's hard to design efficient implementation for it, but not in Bitcoin SV. So there, those are two optimizations that were recently implemented in the BSV node software. There were a bunch of others. For example, uh, there was a descent down to count, met count metric that was used to remove the transaction from mempool when mempool was getting full. The algorithm was slow and did not work well. So we re completely removed the descent down to count limit, limit and implement a faster algorithm that removes just what is needed and also removes the transactions from the end of the uh, chain pips. So the results of all these optimizations can be seen on those three charts that show time that is required to submit 2 million transactions to the node. Left one is 2 million independent transactions. The middle one is uh, 2 million transactions which are organized in chains of uh, length 50. And the last one is for chain length of 1000. The blue line uh, represents the software before the optimization and the yellow line represents the 107 version that was uh, released recently. So we can see that uh, when we do not have dependent transactions, they both versions perform almost the same. But with chain length of 1000, the difference is striking. The new version is as fast as for independent transaction. It's actually a little faster because it does not have a, to do a UTXO lookup. Uh, coins are already in the mempool. But the old version, blue line, can take several hours to process two, millions, uh, two million transactions organized in chain length of uh, 1,000. So to sum up, if your transaction is paying enough, it will go enough, uh, it, it will go directly into the primary mempool, which currently supports uh, chain length, uh, chains that are 1,000, uh, 10,000 transactions deep. Okay. If the transaction is not paying enough, it will end up in the secondary mempool, which is smaller, uh, 10 times smaller by default, this means that your transaction get, can get evicted, but it's still useful for double spend protection uh, and for speeding up block validation. It also does not support uh, long chains. Uh, 
Another consolida consolidation that uh, thing that you should take into account is that if you're submitting very complex graph at very high speed, the transaction can get mixed up during propagation of the network. If this happens, if a child arrives before its parents, uh, the child will be put into the orphan pool where it will wait for parents to arrive. And when all parents are present, uh, the node will validate the transaction. This can extend uh, transaction propagation time. Okay, now that we demonstrated that BSE can process very long chains, let's move to a double spent attempt notification. A double spent is when double spent attempt, okay, is when somebody creates two transactions that try to spend the same coin. And since a coin can only be spent once, this means that something fishy is going on. So how does the notification work? Merchant receives transaction from a client and send it to the Bitcoin network through Merchant API, which is an easy to use the REST endpoint for submitting transaction. As Steve has already mentioned, when submitting transaction, merchant can subscribe to different services and notification about important events related to this transaction. He can get notified when transaction is included in block to get the Merkle proof or when a double spent attempt is detected. So let's say that customer now wants to cheat and creates another transaction to spend the same coin as the first one. He submitted to the network, hoping that the second transaction will be mined instead of the first and that he will not have to pay for merchant services. So what happens next is the following. When the second transaction reaches the node, the node marks it as invalid since its, its inputs were already spent by the first transaction and it notifies the merchant API Merchant API finds out that merchant subscribes to the notification, notification service and fires back uh, a notification towards the merchant. Merchant can now refuse to deliver service to a customer or he can ask customer for another transaction. But that's not the whole story. Let's zoom in. The merchant API can only re report double spent notification if the double spent uh, double spent attempt, if the double spent was detected by the node that the merchant API is connected to. So what happens if the double spent attempt is um, detected somewhere deep in the network? Let's say that the original transaction propagated through most of the network, but did not reach some of the nodes. So the evil customer can now submit the double spent transaction to the node that did not receive the first transaction. And this node starts propagating transaction to other nodes. Sooner or later, it will reach the node that already has the first transaction and the node will detect a double spend attempt. But what happens now? This node has no idea where the first transaction originated from and is therefore unable to notify a merchant and market. So there are at least two ways how this could be solved. We could introduce a new peer-to-peer -peer message for double spent notification. The message would then be propagated through the network, hoping that it will reach the node that is attached to Merchant API. Each node in the network would need to validate this transaction, and this, this is quite expensive, especially if the whole network is doing it. And it would also be impossible if you are a node that does not have both transactions. So since the attacker does not have to pay for double spent transaction, it will never get mined because the coins were already spent by some by another transaction. This would open up an easy spam attack vector on the network. But let us think again. In reality, there is only one actor which is interested in double spent attempt notification, the one who is receiving the money. In our case, the merchant. So the rest of the network really does not care. So why don't send the notification directly to the person who is interested in. So how does this work? The merchant is interested of getting double spent notification so he can request that the customer gives him a transaction that contains a special op return. This output instructs the node to trigger a callback if it detects a double spent attempt. The special output uh, contains different pieces of information. It starts op false, op return, and then the protocol identifier. But the most important uh, part of this is list of IP addresses of callback servers. So merchant can run its own callback server 
that could process the notification, but we expect that this will be the service that will be set up by miners. The latest uh, Merchant API release 1.3 includes a callback server as a reference implementation that fully implements this protocol. So when the node detects a double spend, it retrieves the uh, IP addresses from the op return output and queries the remote endpoint to find out if it's still interested in the, uh, receiving the notification for this transaction. And if the remote endpoint indicates that it's still interested and that it implements the protocol, uh, all details are sent over, including proof that can be used to check the double spend indeed occurred. In first version of protocol, the proof consists of the whole conflicting transaction. In case of uh, Merchant API reference implementation, Merchant API server then uh, triggers a callback to STV channels or another mechanism to notify the merchant about a double spend attack. So to close up, we've seen how each release of Bitcoin SV node brings up performance improvements. The 107 version included major refactoring that was required for lifting 25 transaction uh, limit. The 108 version, which is now in beta, uh, includes further performance improvements for complex graphs. Uh, it also includes two important changes. It increased the ancestor count limit from 1,000 to 10,000. And because of the other performance improvement, it was also possible to change how ancestor count is calculated. The 107 version uh, could count a transaction multiple times if it was uh, reached through multiple paths. But 108 version now uses graph height when calculating the limit. This means that you can now have much wider graphs and much more complex graphs. And for upcoming 109 version, we still have some tricks hidden in, in our sleeves. And we expect that limit will eventually be completely removed. Uh, the new double spent mark transaction is the last missing piece of the puzzle that enables us to detect uh, double spend which occurs deep in the network. And as Steve demonstrated, there are other uh, important changes in the latest release. So developers, it's now to you to start using these features in your applications. You can find more info in the official documentation. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Matthew. Uh, and out of all of those features, I know the one that has probably had the most attention in the last uh, couple of years is the ancestor limit. Uh, I'm personally quite partial to the double spend uh, notification mechanism because it is the last piece of the puzzle, as Matthew said, um, to providing what is effectively complete double spend protection. Uh, if it's important to you. Uh, of course, it's an optional feature. There's plenty of use cases where you may not need it. Uh, but uh, if, if it is important to you, then um, once this is widely adopted across the network by all miners, uh, it effectively becomes um, uh, impenetrable.